Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Immigration History Research Center, really my home office uh, in Minneapolis, and our very first virtual event of the academic year. A conversation with author Madalena Marinari about her new book, Unwanted Italian and Jewish Mobilization Against Restrictive Immigration Laws, 1882 to 1965. Joining her in conversation is Immigration History Research Center archivist, Daniel Natchez. Before I introduce our speaker, let me first review the outline of the event and our technical guidelines. Dr. Marinari will speak first for about 15 minutes, and then we'll have the conversation between her and Daniel Natchez about uh, 15, 20, 25 minutes. And then we're going to open up for audience Q&A. You can use the Q&A function um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen to post questions anytime uh, during the event, uh, but we won't address those questions until the very last portion of the event. Um, please also know that this webinar is being recorded. We have also put into the chat box, if you haven't opened that up already, a link to Professor Marinari's book uh, on the UNC Press website. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Madalena Marinari to the IHRC. She's an Associate Professor of History at Gustavus Adolphus College in St. Peter, Minnesota. She's published extensively on immigration restriction and immigrant mobilization, including articles published in the Journal of Policy History, the Journal of Gilded Age and Progressive Era, Social Science History, and the Journal of American Ethnic History. She's the author of the book that we're going to be talking about today, Unwanted Italian and Jewish Mobilization Against Restrictive Immigration Laws, 1882 to 1965. And she's also one of the co-editors of the fabulous volume, A Nation of Immigrants Reconsidered, U.S. Society in the Age of Restriction, 1924 to 1965. She's also one of the IHRC's affiliated scholars this year. She's helping us with a number of projects. Uh, she and I are co-editing a special issue of the Journal of American History commemorating the 100th anniversary of the 1921 and 1924 Immigration Acts. She's on the team of scholars that is helping to update the immigration syllabus our online tool for anyone interested in historical perspectives of contemporary immigration debates. And she is leading the next phase of the Immigrants in COVID America project, which just launched uh, earlier this week and has already received a rapid response grant from the Social Science Research Council. Um, you can link to that project in our chat box as well. So thank you so much for joining us. Welcome, Madalena. So excited to have you here. Thank you for having me. Uh, this is so um, exciting. And thank you everyone who is connecting from afar. I think some, uh, for the first time, some of my family members will be uh, connecting as well. It's too bad that we're not meeting in person, but I like the idea that these virtual um, events can actually um, attract a broader audience. So I'm excited about the questions and uh, the Q&A that will follow later. So my book, um, I wanted, I wanted to uh, start off with giving a sense of why I focused on um, these two groups essentially. Sometimes I feel like there's a little bit of historical amnesia about these um, uh, earlier Im uh, immigrants from uh, Southern and Eastern Europe. So here you just have a, one of the many quotes that you can read in the book about um, how Italians were seen um, and Eastern European Jews as um, wretches, as you can see, trooping out wretches physically, mentally, morally. So this, uh, starting in 1882, becomes the immigration problem um, from Europe. And I decided to focus on Italian and Eastern European Jews because these were uh, part of one of the uh, largest migrations in uh, world history moving around the world. The US was just one of the um, 
many countries that they went to. But the moment these uh, groups arrived, they were seen, they, they were targeted for um, immigration restriction because, as you can see from this quote, they were not, they were seen as um, physically, culturally, religiously different and they posed a threat. And at first, this immigration problem uh, is in reference to the first to all the um, immigrants from uh, Europe. But as we'll see in a moment, um, eventually uh, this became code for uh, referring to um, Jewish immigration activists mobilizing against immigration restriction. So some of what I wanted to accomplish in my book was trying to understand who mobilized and why. So both um, groups were very much divided. I think it's safe to say that they pretty much didn't, didn't agree about anything. But to me, it was interesting that uh, in both cases, it's mostly middle-class uh, representatives of both the Jewish community and the Italian community who come together and consciously create organizations that specifically target uh, immigration policy to um, oppose immigration restriction because they felt that it would um, reflect negatively on uh, their role within American society too. The fact that this is a group that mobilized, however, meant that there was quite a bit of tension between, in both communities between, for example, in, on the Jewish side, between Eastern European Jews and the older, more established community of uh, German Jews. And, um, in the Italian community also uh, between especially working class and middle class uh, Italians. In both cases, um, most of the community felt that these representatives were self-appointed, but they also were especially starting uh, in the 1930s too moderate and prone to compromise. So I kind of wanted to test this hypothesis. Were they, uh, were they uh, willing to compromise by choice or was it a structure right, that um, they were working with that didn't give them that many choices? And so then I used this lens on how these three groups mobilized to kind of think about the politics of immigration reform. And so I decided that I shouldn't only look at how these groups mobilized, how they, their agenda and their strategies changed over time, but I should look, also look at uh, how they interacted with restrictionists and what their real um, opportunities were and what power or influence they had to change immigration law or at least influence it. And then I had an additional uh, research question, if you will. Um, and that was, so as Italian and Jewish immigration activists organized, did they work together? Uh, and if so, why? And if they didn't, why not? And it turns out that um, coming together around immigration reform is particularly um, challenging. And that while for, and especially because each group comes from uh, a different vantage point and it has different priorities. So one of the other themes of this book is to look at how when these two groups came together with each other, but also with other uh, ethnic groups that were interested in um, immigration reform. And at least until 1965, these, these coalitions uh, usually um, were uh, full of um, uh, tensions and disagreement, but I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So one thing that they agreed on, so the book starts in uh, 1882, so almost uh, as these groups arrive in larger numbers, there are organized groups of um, Americans who decide to start proposing both in and outside of Congress immigration laws to restrict and target these groups. Um, that even though there is a series of laws between 1882 and uh, 1917 that are passed, none of them are particularly um, effective. And it's in part because most legislators are actually uncomfortable targeting for um, restriction white immigrants. So that doesn't change until World War I, when the literacy test, which was uh, originally proposed at the end of the 19th century, 
um, becomes part of the 1917 uh, Immigration Act. This is one of the most important immigration laws at the time. Um, and the, sec the success of restrictionists is essentially tying uh, the war to the threat that these immigrants pose and the need to act more forcefully. Uh, and increasingly, there is a discussion of shifting away from qualitative to quantitative restriction. Um, but the passage of the literacy test essentially showed uh, to both groups how committed a lot of uh, politicians and uh, Americans were to restricting immigration uh, from Europe, but it also started opening up some um, discussion about how these two groups could effectively um, oppose restriction. So up until 1917, much of the mobilization is around launching uh, um, educational campaign, organizing protests, writing in newspapers, encouraging publication of the, about the contributions of these immigrant groups in the United States. After 1917, during the negotiations for the literacy test, especially the exemptions from the literacy test, it's clear that um, there are a few elements that legislators, even the most uh, restrictionist ones, are uh, willing to negotiate on. And so one of the um, conclusions that the, uh, both Italian and Jewish activists reached to is that family reunion might be um, the only place that they might be able to negotiate with restrictionists. So in response to that pressure that uh, these groups were receiving to be uh, bolder, after 1917, it's clear that their, their ability um, to challenge restriction is really uh, limited, especially as one more restrictive bill than the other is um, considered in Congress. And so you see in 1917, 1918, and 1921, and 1924, a series of laws that specifically target uh, immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe, although they have broader effects, especially 1921 and 1924, because they will also affect immigration from um, Asia and from south of the border. So just to give you a sense of um, how important for a lot of American legislators was the 1924 Immigration Act. So the act essentially imposes uh, quotas on uh, immigrants from the Eastern Hemisphere. But the quotas are calculated in a way so that uh, countries like Italy, Poland, Russia get very small uh, annual quotas. And so the, Im the, the intent is to reduce as much as possible the, um, the number of immigrants who come from these countries. But from the very beginning, it's clear that there are some groups that might be able to enter outside of the quota system. And this is um, the main focus, as we'll see in a moment, of these two, the two groups that I discuss in the book, which is family reunion. That doesn't mean that although uh, Increasingly, between 1924 and 1965, um, Italian and Jewish activists successfully pushed for uh, family reunion exemptions. That doesn't mean that uh, they were, um, everyone was welcoming um, these ideas and supportive of uh, family reunion. And this is just one example of uh, constituents who clearly had um, strong feelings about um, the interest of this European immigrants' desire to uh, reunite. So what happens once the, the door is shut, as they like to say? Uh, Italians and Jews essentially focused on four strategies. So the idea to challenge the quota system outright re really doesn't emerge until um, the late 1950s and 60s. It's not that some groups were, uh, some parts of these groups were not proposing it but um, many um, the leaders of both groups were actively against it because they thought that pushing for the complete repeal of the quota system um, might be too dangerous and, and it might actually um, ruin the, the, the chances that they have of changing the status quo. So this kind of cap this obsession with changing the status quo captures the spirit of much of uh, this group's mobilization, especially in uh, the 30s, 40s, and 50s, where they become convinced that any change 
to the status quo is progress over the existing condition. And so here are some of um, the ideas that they tried to push. Um, so the relocation of unused quotas, immigrant representation and due process. Um, the last two are the ones that are kind of a, a thread. Um, they feel that by, the, by pivoting to skilled, uh, on, uh, towards skilled immigrants, the, the United States are um, ignoring the need for immigrants without uh, skills. And unfortunately, this is something that they uh, will not, were not successful in pushing, but they were much, for success, much more successful in pushing for um, family reunion. So by 1952, there are uh, clear exceptions to um, the quota system for family members to uh, join outside of the quota and these people in turn will be able to call other people, uh, send for other people. That means that even though this period between 24 and 65 is usually presented as um, the, a lull in immigration history, in practice that's not true, not even in the 1930s, because even if you look at the numbers, you'll see that more people came in um, than the numbers warranted. Uh, that really picks up in the in in the 1950s, despite the passage of the McCarran Walter Act, which was supposed to reinforce the idea that um, the United States was a, a restrictive uh, country and did not want more immigrants. So, what was the positive impact of pushing for family reunion? Um, until very recently, um, legislators, even uh, the ones who were the most restrictive and supportive of harsher immigration laws, recognized family reunion as a cornerstone of U.S. immigration policy, in part because they felt that it's a, an integral part element of American identity. Um, the other positive aspect is the one that I was talking about a moment ago, which is family reunion actually allowed for a slowing increase in immigrants admitted through and after 19, um, through 1965 because these were, were immigrants who were coming outside um, the quota system. And so even start, starting in the 1930s, the numbers actually start to uh, creep up and those numbers keep uh, going up in the 50s. And then after 65, when the family uh, reunion is, part, is officially part of the preference system, uh, that becomes one of the ways in which a lot of immigrants come into the country. So in a way, what's striking about these uh, two groups is that um, given the limitations that they had, uh, given the opposition that they faced, um, it's remarkable that they actually managed to focus on this one issue and consistently make progress on them. Uh, and allow more immigrants um, to come in or to find ways for families to reunite. But uh, that doesn't mean that um, there weren't negative consequences. So as I mentioned a moment ago, um, their focus on family reunion came at the expense, for example, of other categories, uh, especially unskilled immigrants. And the neglect of this category or the choice not to focus on it um, came at the expense came at a time when the majority of these immigrants were increasingly immigrants um, of color. So one of the pieces of my, one of the arguments in my book is that um, even anti-restrictionists, so people who mobilize to reform immigration, sometimes um, through the policies they support or push um, have an impact on um, immigration flow, flows to the United States. And then while they, again, uh, succeeded um, in pushing for family reunion, much of their uh, mobilization had really had this um, piecemeal approach, which led a lot of um, legislators essentially to uh, continually tweak uh, the immigration system, which made it a, a much more cumbersome system and in a way even more um, punitive because ev every time these groups found a loophole and they were not the only ones, um, legislators were quick to pass uh, a, a bill or an act that uh, could fix it, which meant that um, increasingly, especially the closer you get to 1965, uh, for example, Congress was flooded with personal bills, which made it almost impossible to operate uh, the immigration system. 
a quick note on these coalitions. So in 1952, uh, a lot of these uh, different groups came um, together thinking that against the, the McCarran-Walter Act. And so it was um, groups from uh, of European origin uh, or um, Asian origin. And the collaboration really, the efforts to collaborate really did not go well, in part because um, there were different um, philosophies. And so, so for example, for um, Jewish activists, it was important to build these broad coalitions, even though in the end, they ended up doing um, a lot of the work and they funded a lot of these movements. But it was be precisely because by the 1920s, the immigration problem was code for Jewish activists trying to change the immigration law. Italians, on the other end, were much more strategic and pragmatic. They only participated in these broader efforts if it benefited Italian immigration. Otherwise, they wouldn't um, participate. Now, I want to mention very briefly, uh, in closing, why um, I'm so excited about giving this talk to this audience. And that's because my multiple research trips to the Immigration History uh, Research Center archive were critical to um, this book. And I arrived, my, I, I distinctly remember that my very first trip, I arrived almost desperate because I had a mountain of uh, research on the Jewish side of this story, but I was really struggling to find um, what Italians were doing because I knew that especially in the um, through the 1930s that this was a very uh, divided community and that not all uh, and that it as a community they couldn't decide how to move forward on um, opposing immigration and this is when um, I came to the IHOCA I found I scoured all the as many Italian newspapers as, as possible I looked at the uh, finding aids of uh, the uh, Osaya the organization of the sons of Italy but then I found this gem uh, the American Committee on Italian migration which was not created until 1952 in response to the McCarran Walter Act but it became um, and major players in the 1950s and 60s. And if I hadn't come um, to Minnesota to do this research, my, this book would probably look very um, different because finding this um, finding aid in this archive then allowed me to go also to do additional research in New York City and then at the Library of Congress. And I'll stop right there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madalena. That was amazing. Um, as someone who's also used the ACIM collections, they are phenomenal. I still remember sitting in the reading room and finding um, the letter from either to or from or maybe both to JFK in the early 50s um, lobbying for immigration reform. Um, so now it's my pleasure to introduce Daniel Nathan. He's been working at the University of Minnesota Libraries Immigration History Research Center archive since 2001. He's in Anderson Library today. He's the institutional memory of the archives and its collections, which document 150 years of immigrant and refugee experiences in the United States. He knows the collections inside and out. He's been instrumental in assisting and guiding countless researchers and students like myself, like Professor Marinari, um, to find exactly those hidden gems uh, in the collections. Over the past 10 years, he's been the chief architect of the Digitizing Immigrant Letters Project, which has made letters from archival collections around the world available online. And more recently, he's been focusing on the records of refugee uh, displacement and resettlement. So welcome, Daniel, and thank you for joining us as well. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, and thank you, Erica, for the introduction. Uh, thank you also for inviting me to, to do this. Uh, I was happy to accept. Um, I remember working with Madalena about five years ago or so. And we, of course, talked about her research a lot, uh, which helped me uh, get a better idea about what she was looking for. 
but we also talked about uh, other things. Uh, I remember many conversations about what we like to cook yes. and eat, and that was most enjoyable as well. Uh, uh, in honor of Madalena, I brought uh, my favorite miniature lemon tree here. Uh, I know that the region around Naples uh, is especially close to Madalena's heart. Uh, so to honor her, I wanted to include this little tree in the picture also, so you don't have to look at just me when I speak, uh, but have something pleasant for the eyes as well. So uh, I would like to ask Madalena to start off with uh, about the development of your idea for the book, Madalena. Uh, how did you become interested in the subject? Um, and what were the driving forces that made you want to write this book? Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for the question and thank you for the nice setup. Um, I thought it was a lemon tree. That makes me really happy. It feels like home. If only I could smell it. Um, so I was actually just emailing with someone this week talking about the genesis of um, this book. And I remember it all started uh, during a um, workshop at UCLA and during a conversation. So I had Sorry for the graduate students in the audience. I had just defended my prospectus um, and I thought I knew what I was going to do for my book. And then I participated in this um, one week long um, workshop where I saw a lot of research presented by sociologists, historians, um, cultural studies, ethnic studies. And as people were presenting, I saw that there was a, a gap that much of the literature thought of, uh, about restriction had um, a focus on restrictionists. So the legislators that were pushed, pushed for this um, restrictive immigration laws. And that while we knew a lot, like thanks to Erica, for example, about how um, Chinese groups had mobilized against Asian exclusion, um, I realized that we really didn't know much about um, what European immigrants had done. And so I came home, I um, emailed my advisor and said, my research is completely changed. So I wouldn't advise anyone to do that. So think about more <laughs> deeply about what you want to do. But um, it was, it, I was so lucky that I had this opportunity to kind of think about um, how to reframe something that we know a lot of, right? This uh, push for restriction. Uh, in, a, in a way that might be interesting and relevant. But what was important from that workshop and something that I've tried to do ever since was actually my interest in seeing not just what these groups were doing, so Italians and Jews. So I realized that these two groups were gonna be my focus because they were the main target. But I was also curious to learn a little bit more about how they collaborated with other groups and how they were inspired by what other groups were um, doing. And so for me, uh, one of the goals was, okay, well, if they were uh, reading and paying attention to what uh, Chinese Americans were doing, for example, then maybe this should be part of the story too. So this was kind of uh, the first uh, aha moment. But then another one actually arrived, came when I went to do research at the National Archives uh, and went to the Center for Legislative History for the first time. Um, which is challenging and we can talk more about that um, to, to be able to find things um, in that archive. But I found a treasure trove of letters from um, constituents essentially to all uh, these politicians that were passing all these uh, laws or proposing these bills. And so that's when I really realized. So at that point I had defended my dissertation, I was revising my book and I realized that I should really expand and see really this interaction between restrictions and anti-restrictionists. And so I became a detective and um, got to know probably more than I should about some of these um, politicians. But that's just, those are like the two pivotal moment, moments behind this book. Great, thank you. Uh, so you mentioned politicians. Uh, they figure prominently in your book, uh, but there are other characters as well. Um, I would like to ask you now if you, during your 
researching and writing of the book, did you develop a special affection or admiration for any of the characters who appear in your book uh, or a particular dislike? Uh, in other words, who are your heroes in the story and who are the villains? And to give you a little more time to think about it, I'm just going to mention two that uh, stood out for me. Uh, uh, the first one was Joseph Senner, the, the second commissioner of immigration appointed in 1893 at Ellis Island, himself an, an immigrant from Central Europe and he was the commissioner for about four or five years. Um, so I actually went, I, I had heard of him before, but reading about him again in your book made me want to learn more. So I went and learned more and I want to keep doing that. And on the other side, it was Edward Bemis, uh, uh, the literacy test <laughs> proponent in 1888. Uh, I actually went and found that article in Andover Review that he published about the literacy test. I was stunned uh, how, how little he talked about the sources for his articles. He makes all these sweeping generalizations about entire nations. And uh, his main sources were reports and conversations with uh, American consuls abroad and a few random visits to Ellis Island that seemed to be the main. Uh, so sometimes he got his ethnic groups in Europe wrong. Uh, yeah. Amazing. Yet this man was very influential in uh, introducing and uh, pushing through this literacy test. Anyway, so now you've had some time to think about your heroes and villains. <laughs> well, you know, um... I've actually thought a lot about this. So for the longest time, I have to be honest, I was very ambivalent about many of the characters I describe in the book in terms of um, pushing for immigration reform, right? Because there is a, a strong element of self-interest, right? They're also doing it for themselves. I mean, they say that it's to help um, few prospective immigrants from uh, Europe, but it's really also to make sure that they are accepted and integrated into American society. But I think the current situation um, makes me appreciate a little bit more why they felt compelled to um, negotiate, compromise, and why by the 50s especially, they're obsessed with this idea that, they, that any improvement over the status quo is better than nothing. So um, while maybe I would side more with people who wanted to bigger changes right away. I have to say that I've gained a new appreciation for um, the strategy and their strategies and their commitment, right? Uh, these are not perfect people, uh, especially when it comes to um, who exactly they're fighting for, right? Especially in, in the 50s, they have they skillfully used civil rights and human rights language, but they're clearly mostly focusing on um, white immigrants. And so they're, they're problematic, they're, they're flawed heroes. But I can tell you someone I really don't like <laughs> was Patrick McCarran, um, so the, the senator from Nevada. People called him the, the boss of Nevada because he was very proud of saying that when he was elected, he knew all of, 100, all of his 100,000 uh, constituents in Nevada. I mean, this, this person had so much power. By 52, he was on really the most, all of the key committees, and he was controlling immigration, funding to the State Department. And so all of these um, sources of power came together and he actually influenced immigration policy in ways that I think we're still kind of uh, realizing uh, today. But one of the reasons why I dislike him, sorry, it's gonna have to do another with an archive story, is that when I went there uh, in uh, Reno, Nevada, very fascinating, I went through 10 or 15 boxes that were related to this um, law, just, just to the uh, Immigration Act. And I could not find one sliver of criticism. And so if you had gone there, you would think that everyone was really, really happy about this law. And so I thought, what's happening? And so finally I talked to an archivist and they said that when he died, essentially his administrative assistant uh, before turning him over 
is archive called everyone who was family and friends to him and said let's preserve the memory of McCarran which really meant let's take out all the criticism out and so it, to me uh, how to consciously try to preserve a certain identity um, knowing how much he hated uh, Itali he hated Italians and he also was a, a rabid anti-Semite especially towards the end of the, his life the only kind of uh, European immigrants that he liked was were Spanish uh, and he had uh, he actually passed a special bill just to bring Spanish shepherds to uh, Nevada. He was a great admirer of Franco. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But um, I have a hard time finding sympathy for him. So I would say that he's definitely not on my good people list. <laughs> so uh, Jewish and Italian immigrants were not among his favorites, uh, probably. Uh, Definitely not. <laughs> Whereas you spent a lot of time learning about these two immigrant groups. Uh, so could you tell us if you learned anything while you were doing your research that was very surprising to you about these two immigrant groups? Uh, something that maybe changed your perspective or views, perceptions, or maybe, maybe even stereotypes about these two immigrant groups? that you may have previously held about them? I'll tell you about two surprises. Um, so one of the things that I felt uncomfortable with at first was the fact that much of the advocacy on the Jewish side came from um, the older established German community. And I just, um, I was obsessed with the idea that I was missing um, something and so I went into another archive and I said I don't speak Yiddish I taught myself a little bit of it um, but then someone said if Eastern European Jews said anything relevant related to immigration policy the American Jewish community translated it which turned out to be absolutely true um, and so it was an alliance of convenience um, when it came to immigration policy so that was surprising right because these two groups really um, they cannot see eye to eye for the longest time, but it seems that immigration policy uh, was one topic in where at least they tried to collaborate somehow and work together, uh, especially um, in the first couple of decades. On the Italian side, one thing that I, I did not um, anticipate is when I went to and looked at the um, archives in Italy, how much these Italian bureaucrats who are, who are mostly from Central or Northern Italy really disliked Southern Italians. Mm -hmm. I mean, on one end, publicly, they're saying that they're talking to um, immigration, um, to legislators in the United States saying, these laws are too harsh. Uh, we will work with you. Let's find a way to collaborate because these people uh, want to just contribute to the greatness of the United States. Behind the scenes, however, they re I mean, the, they were terrible. I mean, they said, I mean, there are a couple of them who say, no wonder Americans don't want them, right? They're ignorant. Um, they are slow in uh, naturalizing, especially this is before Mussolini, especially. Um, or they are not interested in learning English, they're not interested in um, settling. So that really surprised me. And even in the, by the time you get to the 1950s, where all of a sudden Italian Americans are a prize uh, commodity because they can help advance Italian foreign policy interests, they're not exactly, um, Italian bureaucrats are not exactly, you know, welcoming or don't, they don't really have a positive image um, of these groups that are actually really, really important um, in their ability to advocate for Italy. And so that I have to say really surprised me. I, I mean, I guess I, I shouldn't have been, but reading it really um, was jarring at least at first. Thank you. Um, so you've mentioned now at least three archives that I can think of. Uh, archives in Italy, the National Archives, archives in Nevada, uh, the IHRC archives. 
So you're making it really easy for me to, uh, to get into questions about archives. And you obviously uh, visited many different archival institutions when you were uh, doing your work. So I, I want to ask you um, about how standardized or not were the procedures in these different archives in making the materials available to you? Did you have to learn uh, every time you came to a new archive, a new way to uh, behave, quote unquote, in the reading room? Were you able to make your own copies of materials? Um, what were the approaches and attitudes of the different staff members um, in the archives that you visited? So I have three buckets, uh, two about the US and then Italy. Italy is a whole other level. Uh, so the, there, is a, there was a, a big learning curve in the United States, but I have to say, um, every, so the net, I'm going to talk about the National Archives and the, the archives that are not part of the National Archives. So all the other archives like the IHRC, um, the archives in the, li the Library of Congress, the um, uh, Jewish Historical Society, the archives in Cincinnati, once I visited one, I felt comfortable knowing what the expectations were, right? And in all of them, to a T, I was ex there was always someone who was excited about what I was working on and who was willing to, I had lots of coffee. <laughs> and was, it, it was willing to listen to me and kind of um, give me guidelines and email with me when I was left, when I left. And that, um, because I was used to the Italian experience that I will get into uh, uh, in a moment, was really surprising. So I was really um, struck by how generous people were with their time and their willingness to really um, help me. And in, in terms of the procedure, so I've, I've done research for about a decade. So I, I think I was caught between photocopying and taking photos. And I could tell that at various times, people were kind of thinking about the threat of letting people, right, uh, taking photos. And so, but no one, it was, it was never too difficult or challenging to uh, navigate. The National Archives are another thing, for, at least for me. I'm so intimidated by it that I mess up every time I go. Like, I never, for some reason, I never put the document on the table the, right, the way that they want it. To, I don't even know how many times I've been there and every time I have an archivist come and scold me. Um, so I'm either like so paralyzed by it that I unconsciously make a mistake, but um, they're also because they, they have so many people, they're not as, um, I guess, willing to work with you. And someone told me that like, researchers are not our, our primary target. It's mostly genealogists because they have so many people coming in, right? And I, mm -hmm. and I understand that. Um, but to this day, it's still a struggle for me to go in the National Archives. And in the US, I've only had one place where it was difficult um, to access material. Um, and more than anything, they just asked uh, a lot of questions. That was the, the, the Truman Library. On the very um, kind of no rules whatsoever was the Historical Society in Nevada where it was complete chaos. It's like, oh, I want, I, want, I want some rules. Like people were talking out loud, taking photos, like people were not paying attention to, with the documents, handling that. It's like, no, please be careful. Um, and also because people were there to do genealogy, I got a lot of questions. I was researching McCann. It's like, so are you related to him? Is that why? It's like, God, no. <laughs> um, but this is nothing compared to, um, Italy where you know you need a letter of introduction if you're a graduate student and if you're a professor um, and you're not a professor in Italy you're clearly treated uh, differently um, if you ask questions you get into a lot of trouble and you probably remember Daniel that I asked a lot of questions so by the end of it at the um, for a ministry archive I'd become la famosa marinari because um, I kept asking it's like I asked you for this folder, why did you bring me another one? Uh, uh, one day, all the archivists went on strike, so they closed for a week. It's like, I only have 10 days. 
Uh, so there's a lot of predictability in US archives that you absolutely cannot have or rely on. Definitely in Italy. I've only done um, a research, archival research in Italy uh, outside of the US. And, you know, it's very humbling because it, it teaches you persistence, essentially. And, and, and there isn't, um, none of the rules that uh, are in place in the US are in place there um mm -hmm. and it seems very capricious about whether or not they want to help you sorry for the time well, i don't recall you getting in trouble when you were here so. <laughs> good <laughs> i hope it went well for you uh i know you talked about the acim collection are there any other collections that you want to maybe mention just very briefly that that were of particular use or, or interest to you here in the IHRC archives? What's amazing is really the, the massive number of Italian newspapers. And, you know, you could, because you could get a really broad swath of uh, what uh, different groups within the Italian communities thought. And so I was, that, I was just so grateful that everything was here. Um, Osaya was another one, but I don't think I'm the, I'm the only one who's looked at that. Um, but I also, um, the fact that uh, you also have government documents, so it's not just that you have things uh, about specific groups, you also have microfilm. Mm -hmm. I think what was useful about that is that you would find, at least I would find something um, in uh, ACIM or Osaya or the newspapers, and then I could also check what was going on um, in hearings or something, which I, which I think is, it's not something that you can get in any archive. So the fact that you could actually cross-reference was, part that, that's my biggest memory of my uh, two research trips at the IHS. It's like, I can do both. Um, and that's how um, I think I got my first idea for a second book as well. So that I really appreciated. That's nice to hear. Uh, and I'm going to put a link to the ACIM collection in the chat when Marilena uh, responds to my next question, and that is about uh, the use of the book, um, your book, in your teaching. Uh, have you been able to use at least some of it in your teaching? And if so, how do your students react? I know at the end of your book, you have a brief story about a student mm -hmm. uh, who came to your office, but perhaps you have more uh, yeah, so it's it's always, a, I think, a little strange to assign um, your own work. So I definitely include a, a lot of my findings in really all of the classes I, I teach. But I think talking about my book comes particularly, becomes particularly important um, in two classes, in the research methods course, uh, because we can have these kinds of conversation, but also uh, in the capstone where students write their um, thesis. But as I was actually finishing this um, book, I was stuck on the conclusion. Amazingly enough, it's the shortest thing in the book. It was the hardest for me to write. I don't even know how many times they revised it. And at one point I was so desperate that I actually brought it to my immigration history um, class students and had them read it. And um, it was actually really, it was a great conversation because I had to tell them about my research in order for them to understand the conclusion. It was, it was just really productive. I think it was also useful for them to see that we struggle as well. Uh, and that, you know, these books are not, don't come out of nowhere, but actually there is a lot of uh, work and time that goes into them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My last question and something you've mentioned before also is about the current and future uh, work that you intend to get engaged in. So how has your work on the book shaped your, or redirected your current and future research interests? I know we have to switch the Q&A, so I'll be very brief, but I think one uh, question that I kept getting over and over again is, okay, we have the story through the eyes of these uh, middle-class Italian and Jewish Americans activists. What about the regular people? And so now the next book will probably be about the people, the other side uh, of the story. And it's probably going to look at um, undocumented 
um, Europeans coming uh, into the country more or less to during the same time period. Right. Well, we shall look forward to that new book. Uh, thank, thank you for uh, all your insights and ideas and observations. And I'll hand, turn it over to Erica. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks so much. I can. I was smiling throughout the whole conversation because it's exactly the kind of historian, archive, nerdy conversation that I think we all love, where we're getting our hands dirty in the archives and um, and finding those those hidden gems. So we've got a lot of questions in the chat box. Um, I wanted to start with one um, that I thought about when I was reading your book. You know, historians are supposed to be, uh, we're supposed to sort of immerse ourselves in the past, but as we know, the contemporary events swirling around us impact the questions that we ask, um, they impact how we might look at a particular topic. And it dawned on me that while you were conducting research for first your dissertation and then the book, there were two major um, movements for comprehensive immigration reform, which were all about um, compromise. You know, and one of the main theses of your book is how these um, two groups mobilized sort of incrementally, you know, they had lots of institutional um, factors working against them and obstacles. And so the more moderate approaches were one of the ways in which they were able to achieve some of their goals. Was was that contemporary political context in the US either during um, the Bush or the Obama administration and those ongoing efforts at comprehensive immigration reform, did they impact what you were then looking at in the, in the archives or did you think of them as very separate? I'll be completely honest, it was actually really difficult to separate the two. But rather than trying to distance myself, and I, I thought that actually it would be useful to look at what was happening in the present and look at kind of the, the questions and frustrations that were going on right now and see what, what was it like in the past? Like were people asking similar questions? Were people feeling similar uh, frustrations? And it turns out that this is when I realized that I should pay more attention to the critics of these two groups that emerged. And so what was interesting to me is that it that was probably the hardest thing to look for. And I don't know if the record hasn't been, so their voices are just not um, in the record because it has, they haven't been preserved. But it was, to me, it was fascinating how you have a lot of tensions in the 1910s and 1920s and then you, they reach some of uh, some sort of a consensus. And then it's not until the 40s that people say, wow, you really sold, I mean, there are young people who are really frustrated and say, you sold us out with this piecemeal approach. Um, but these two groups were very much conscious that, I'll, I'll, I'll change that. They thought that they could not influence politicians. And I think that's different whether they, uh, they, they can or not is different than would, if they believed that they could. Um, and in the private conversations that then I found, it was clear that they took these criticisms seriously, but they always, over and over again, they came to the conclusion that um, less flashy, less flamboyant um, changes would actually have would A, guarantee some success and some progress, but also more, they were more likely to help uh, more people than the status quo. Great. Uh, okay, so we have a waiting list of questions. I'm going to um, start with one, and then I'm going to lump a couple of them together, um, and hopefully we'll get to, we'll get to, um, to most of them. So the first question is from our friend Donna in Toronto, okay. Donna Gabaccia. She says first, hi, everybody. Um, and she wants to ask about the earliest uh, history of provisions of family reunif uh, reunification, family reunion 
Um, weren't there comparable provisions in Chinese exclusion? Yes. Um, but if not, where did the idea of family reunion come from, which otherwise unsympathetic American legislators were, more, were most willing to consider uh, such exceptions to restrictions? So the first time that they realized that uh, this is uh, up for negotiation is actually during the debates over the literacy test. Uh, and it's because um, the Jewish activists that zero in, once they realized that this test is going to pass, they decided to focus on who is exempted. And one of the arguments that they make um, is the breadwinner should pass the test, but maybe his wife and his younger children should not. Um, and so not, not all of their arguments worked, but they really come uh, to the forefront in 1921, where the first quota system essentially is a disaster because they passed a re this really harsh immigration law without being prepared to enforce it. And so one of the most immediate uh, results is the, se the family of separation. But they also, so they go to Congress, they go to court, and they intentionally focus on, quote unquote, the good immigrants. So they choose the professor, the pastor, the merchant, right, who would be really good members of the society. And now they're separated from um, their families. And so I think that's another part of the story that I forgot to mention that um, they're very careful on when they focus on who is who they're helping exactly, right? Uh, it's always the good versus bad immigrant. They always say, we accept restriction, but what about the, the good kind of immigrants? Okay, I'm going to um, put four different questions together, <laughs> I'll take but, they are, <laughs> but they are all interested in the perspective and actions of the activists themselves. Mm -hmm. So first, um, Patrick Edinger wants to know about um, how constituent letters to politicians, so you were talking about that in between period, um, what were some of the ideas that were expressed in the constituent levels, their opposition to restrictions? Mm -hmm. um, Julie Wise wants to know about how the activists responded to the rise of the Nazis and the persecution of Jews um, in Europe. And Sheer Gnor and Jane Hong both want to know more about on the one hand, um, collaboration between different groups and how did they work together as a coalition? And Jane wants to know what lessons, what lessons from um, immigration advocacy from the earlier period might be helpful for activists today? I will do my best to cover them all in two minutes. Um, constituent letters, actually, those letters are really fascinating because you see how um, certain generalizations that we see today uh, take place. So early, um, between the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, so until the 1910s, there is a lot about assimilation, how these people are unassimilable. But then it, it switches to um, economic arguments. Uh, sometimes there is a lot of, um, in the 20s especially, a lot of eugenics, eugenicist arguments. It's like, these just don't make good future citizens. One thing that is different, I think, from between then and now, is that much of these discussions are framed around citizenship. So they were really worried about admitting immigrants that would be good citizenship material, which I don't think we have today. Um, response to the Nazis. Um, there is a lot of angry. The 1930s are actually really, really difficult for um, the Jewish community, uh, in part because they thought that they were fully integrated in the United States and they had this through the uh, to Roosevelt and the New Deal that they had an impact and the fact that they just couldn't um, influence Roosevelt became an endless source of frustration, but it also made them realize that during World War II and right after they wouldn't be able to fight for Jewish refugees unless they created these broad coalitions, which bring me, brings me to the other question. Um, so throughout the book, especially among European um, activists, it's always Jewish groups that push for these broad 
um, coalitions, but they're often the ones who bring people together, fund a lot of these campaigns and do a lot of the legwork. And it's because they're kind of, they're marked with, they are the ones who always bring up the immigration problem. So they are the ones who intentionally try to, try to create these coalitions that are uh, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, um, but it's not that some of the other groups don't realize what's going on. And so I think that's what's, where some of the tension comes from. It's like, you're clearly doing this for your own group. So why don't we all recognize that we're all coming to this from, to help our own specific constituents? Lessons in the 20 seconds that I have. Um, I think it's good to try at least to understand where the dif these different groups come from right so if you're white you should probably understand that an immigrant of color comes uh, at the, to the table with different uh priorities political ideologies i mean i think this is um one of the biggest challenges is that these people really cross talked across each other but they weren't really listening um to each other so i, I think that that was perhaps because they were re really good at coordinating uh, and letter writing campaign, educational campaigns, but uh, they never really understood where uh, the other group's concern was were coming from. Sorry. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Um, I've gotten some of the questions that uh, you were not able to to answer, and I'll I'll send those to you as well. Uh, so thank you everybody for, for joining us. Thank you, Madalena. Thank you, Daniel. This has been a great conversation. Um, I hope that you all will join us again on Tuesday, October 20th, 4 p.m. for our next event, which is covering immigration in an election year. It will be a conversation between Dara Lind, who is a leading immigration reporter with ProPublica, and uh, our own Ibrahim Hersey, a uh, well-known journalist here in Minnesota and IHRC staffer. You can find out more information um, through our newsletter on Facebook and Twitter. And if you have not already done so, please check out our just launched Immigrants in COVID America project that Madalena is now going to be leading um, at immigrantcovid.umn.edu. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you again, Madalena. Thank you, Daniel. Bye.